Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. I want to deal with uh, something mentioned here, verse 4 through verse 7 of Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that would be us, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, um, and I'll read verse 6 and 7 here a little bit. Uh, my wife and I adopted a son. Um, I don't talk about it much, um, but we decided years ago to take in this cute little boy, baby boy. And one of the things that I knew that I had to do before we took him into our home was that I had to settle it in my mind and in my heart, and I asked God for this, that I would have to love him just like he was my son from my own body. Just like I love my girls and my oldest son, I had to love this one just like he was my son. And so I asked God for that, and God helped me with that. And I can say without any reservation, without any doubt, that I love this child as much as I love any of my other children, as much as I love my grandchildren, as much as I love anybody on this earth, I love him that way. I don't treat him better or worse than I treated any of my other children. He's a little different, naturally, but I don't treat him any better or any worse. When I die, if the Lord tarries is coming, and they're going to start divvying up my earthly belongings and any insurance money, uh, he is part of that. He is part of that inheritance, equal with my other children. That's very, very important because when we were adopted by God, God sees us just like He sees His only begotten Son. We are joint heirs with Jesus, the Bible says. So we're going to look at the idea of being sons of God or children of God. And because that's what he says here, to redeem that we're under, them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We have received that by way of Christ making the way for us. Christ, uh, talk about love. God not only loving us, by sending His only begotten Son. You need to fathom that, comprehend that. The equivalent would be, let's say that um, you wanted to adopt a child, and but this child had something wrong in its heart or something like that, and it turns out that one of your other children, let's say your son, was a perfect match to the one that you wanted to adopt and you sacrificed one son so that the other son could live. And we would we'd be going, no, I, I don't think I would do that. And be, trust me, there's nothing wrong with that. But just to show you how much God loves you, He sacrificed His only begotten Son for our benefit. That is pure love. Love like that, we would have a hard time doing something. In fact, most people would never do that. And again, there's nothing, I'm not saying that's wrong to not do that because it's natural to love your, your children that come out of your own body. That's natural love. And nothing wrong with that. But God set His love upon us and sacrificed His only begotten Son for our benefit. 
love like that, I, I have a hard time comprehending. I'm thankful for it. But I don't understand it. I, because it's God's love. All right? Um, verse 6, And because you're sons, just like His only begotten Son, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Same thing that Jesus called Him, we call Him. Same Spirit that Jesus has, we have. In fact, uh, let's see, Isaiah is the, Isaiah 11 is where the seven spirits of God are. And if you look at that passage, there shall, uh, verse 1, Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the King James translators knew that that branch was Christ. They capitalized the letter B in branch. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The seven spirits of God that are on Jesus are in us as well. Same spirit, all right? Uh, with, I guess without measure. Same spirit that's in Christ, same spirit is in us. And that spirit now sees God as not some distant, far out, bearded, um, mean, angry God that is going to dispose of us all because of our wickedness. He now is our Father, and we live in His house. We dwell with Him. He has taken us in and put His love on us. Whew. I'm just overwhelmed. Verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. All right? Now, uh, what we're going to do, and it may take, yeah, it may take a little while. Probably won't get it all through today. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at this idea of being a son of God being children of God. Not, that's not just a, a t-shirt that we wear. Son of God. It, it is an actual thing. It is how God sees us. All right. Now, here's the interesting thing. And I've brought this up before in the teaching on the giants. That the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament is exclusively reserved for the angelic beings. We go to, we know that that phrase is in Genesis 6. That concept is contested by many people. Now, I understand that, okay? Uh, but I would, I would disagree with anybody who would say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are something other than the angelic beings because the Bible just doesn't, doesn't teach that, doesn't say it. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So we would have this idea, according to this, that there was a gathering of the angelic creatures. They came to present themselves before God. Satan showed up at the meeting. Hey, what y'all doing? Okay. How many of you would like to join with me? I... About a third of you. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. And then the second time, Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, these two verses don't just explicitly describe sons of God as angels. But, the next time, I just, I just thought of this, uh, sons of God... That exact phrase would be four times. I'll look it up here shortly. I'll try to multitask here. My King James Fear Bible Search software. The sons of God would be four times in the Old Testament. Four times. Four is the number for the spiritual realm. All right. Um, Ephesians talks about that we may with all the saints understand what is the length, breadth, the depth, and the height. Four, there's four directions there. The fourth kingdom. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. All right? So that number four represents um, the angelic realm or the spiritual realm. So I'm just going to make sure. I'm going to type this in. Sons 
of God into pure Bible search software. Uh, Genesis 2, Gen no, I was wrong, I was wrong. Genesis 6-2, Genesis 6-4, Job 1-6, Job 2-1, and Job 38-7. So five times in the Old Testament. See, that's verify. Always check, all right? Always check yourself out. Anyway, Job 38 then would be the fifth occurrence of the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament. Um, and it then gives us the idea that these are angelic creatures. Job 38, let's start in verse 3 so we get the context of the verse. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. God is talking to Job here, and he's saying, Job, pull your pants up, stand up, stand up like a man, okay? Me and you is going to have a talk, man to man, all right? Job, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, Job, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, Job? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, when the morning stars sang together. Stars are angels. In the Bible, stars are angels. No doubt about it. No, no argument, nothing. Stars are angels, all right? The sons of God are the morning stars, and they are angels, all right? Now, here's what I want you to think of. Angels are a, I'm going to use the word race, a nation, that's the Bible term. Angels are a nation, a group of creatures that God made who inhabit the heavenly realm. They take on different appearances. Some of them look like men. Some of them, I would say many of them, look like different creatures or a conglomeration of creatures. In Ezekiel 1, you have the four living creatures, and the four living creatures, each one of them has four faces. And one face is the face of a man, one face is the face of an ox, one the face of an eagle, and one the face of a lion. Now, I cannot visualize or imagine in my mind exactly what Ezekiel saw, uh, but I believe it. I believe every word of it. But I believe that creatures like lions, dogs, eagles, owls, um, just different animals like that that you see mentioned in the Bible, that there is an angelic realm equivalent of that, all right? Uh, bulls. Uh, we know that the Israelites worshipped a golden calf, all right? They're referring to a particular god, Baal. Um, so anyway, don't let that scare you. I'm not saying that when you die and go to heaven, you're going to be a bull, all right? Uh, even though some of you may be bullheaded now, okay? Dun -dun -dun. Um, but anyway, we are going, we're not going to take on the image of a bull or any kind of beast. We are going to take on the image of Jesus Christ, all right? We're going to be in his image. God has set us apart. So, and the reason why I bring this up is, is that when we go transfer to the New Testament now, the idea of the sons of God, children of God, it is applied, I think, exclusively to the saints, those who are born again. Um, there, is, there is a verse in Hosea, before I run off here into the New Testament, uh, you type in sons of God, you won't find it. If you type in sons of the living God, you'll see it. Hosea chapter 1, uh, verse 10, God makes a promise to Israel that they will become sons of God. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, 
which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Now again, this is not just a bumper sticker or a t-shirt that they wear, or a jersey, if, you know, a sports uniform where it says tigers. It doesn't mean that every member of the team is literally a tiger, all right? And it, so it's that same idea. This is not just a title that God gives us, but it doesn't have that meaning. If God calls us his son, we are his son. Think of what he said in Hebrews 12 concerning if God sees us as a son, then he chastens us like we are his sons. He is our father. We are the, we are the sons. We are the children of God. And if we step out of line, then God will chasten us for that because that's what fathers do to their children. With the exception of one, there's always the good kid. Jesus Christ never did anything wrong. So what happened? He took our stripes that we should have received under the law. He took them from us and took them on his own body. Imagine if you had an older brother or an older sister or whatever. You had an older sibling and you got in bad trouble and your parents were going to come down on you like trees falling, something, I don't know. They were going to come down on you hard. And your older brother stepped in and said, Mom, I know you're mad. Whatever punishment you're going to give out, give it to me, and I mean it. You said you were going to whip her. Then you whip me. I, I'm going to take her punishment. Okay, And then you're going, why are you doing that? Because I love you. I love you. And you can't bear this. So I'm going to do it for you. This is, why, this is why we'll spend eternity praising and worshiping the Lord and never be done. It will take eternity to worship God sufficiently what he has done for us okay so he makes Israel the promise ye are the sons of the living God then in the New Testament we find out that God makes that promise to all of us his promise still intact to Israel don't forget that and we'll see that a little bit later on probably not today but we'll see it but he then makes that promise to all of us because of Israel's hardness of, of, of her heart. Here's the Messiah. They, didn't, they rejected him. So now salvation then is offered to us Gentiles. So now we have, through Christ, the power to become. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I love John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. Speaking of John the Baptist, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, mm. which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Think about that one for a while. You, you made a choice. You decided to 
Live for God. Let Jesus into your heart. Let him save you. Let him wash you clean. Put his spirit in you, crying, Abba, Father. And um, you did choose to be saved. God does not take away your free will. But God is the one who worked out all the circumstances to where you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to choose Jesus. Right? Yet, it's by grace through faith. Well, the grace comes from God, but also the faith comes from God. It's sometimes too hard for me to fully comprehend. But it's all about God. And God chose you because God sees the outcome of your life and he sees the decisions that you make throughout life and he sees you remaining in belief, not works, belief, trust, faith. You continue in faith. God elects you. You are born to be a son of God by the will of God, all right? Not by the will of man. But anyway, to as many as Received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. So what is that saying? If the, if the sons of God refers to angels in the Old Testament, now it's saying that we're going to become like the angels? Yes. And of the angelic realm, you have spiritual creatures that, number one, do not ever die. Number two, um... They are one step above us as far as dimensions. They are not bound by the laws of this three-dimensional world. They can appear, disappear, they can go through walls, and yet they can sit down and have their feet washed and eat a meal with Abraham. And apparently, they have the ability to procreate with human women. It's just, that's what the Bible teaches, all right? But anyway, um, yes, we are going to become, and I've got, let me read, where is it? Yeah, um, Jesus said, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. That's what it says of us, we will be like the angels of of God in heaven. We will be the sons of God. We will be, and that, that term really means immortal. We are going to go from mortality to immortality, from corruption to incorruption is what we're going to turn to. So literally, we're going to be transformed into and have the, the body, the being of angels, all right? Uh, now, Romans 8, and we'll probably... Uh, Romans 8 has a lot to say about the sons of God. So we'll probably look at this, and then I'll draw a line here, and we'll pick up on it next week, all right? Romans chapter 8, verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and yes, your body right now is dead. You consider it dead. You know you're going to die. You know the body is corrupting more and more each and every day. I was talking to uh, a man yesterday. We are of equal age, and we were talking about our bodies. And we've known each other for years. And when we first met, we had these nice, young, healthy, 20-some-odd-year-old bodies. Okay, We had good, strong arms, good, strong backs. We were lean. We didn't have all the... the uh, some of the ravages that age brings on, but then 20, 25, 30 years later, we don't bounce back the way we used to. We could sleep longer than we used to. Um, we don't bend like we used to. We, we're not as limber as we used to be. We're not as, we're like cars, all right? Things are starting to wear down in this automobile and we're at the stage now to where everything has to be looked at because we know that at any point from here on out, something could go wrong with this. But it's just like a car. You buy a car, it's brand new. You don't have any problems with it. You don't expect things should start going bad immediately. Okay, you, you just don't 
but, but that as time goes on and the mileage comes on, the accidents happen, things like that, then, and if you don't take care of it especially, okay, uh, then things start to break down and we're just in that monitoring stage. We're going to see doctors now who are taking blood tests and they're looking, taking blood pressures and wanting to measure this, wanting to look in this, want to take a peek in this and everything like that. And that's the age we are right now. We're at this monitoring stage. But, and at pretty soon, it's going to go beyond just monitoring. It's going to go, we got to take that out. We got a new one we're going to put in here. And then for too long, we get to the point where they say, well, it wouldn't do really any good to replace that body part. They're not going to live very long anyway. We're dead. Our bodies are just one day at a time becoming more and more corrupt, more and more useless, and we're heading in that direction. So, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Christ's righteousness not yours never yours always only christ's righteousness mm. but if the spirit of him that raised up jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you so the same spirit that put breath back into the body, the physical body of Jesus Christ, same spirit that's going to quicken our mortal bodies, raise us literally from the dead. Oh, I love that. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. And you will. You will spend not just this momentary death thing, you will spend an eternity in the state of conscious death. You'll know that you're in the place of death, in the land of death, suffering the vengeance of God on your new resurrected body that God's, if you're lost, there is the resurrection of the damned at the great white throne judgment and they, he resurrects them and then casts them all into the lake of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth, all right? And that's if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify, kill them, the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Mortify the deeds of the body. One thing at a time, one day at a time, God, kill this in me. God, God is the husbandman. We, remember, we are the branches of the vine. The husbandman looks at you, the branch, and says, that's not good. We're going to get that off of you. Okay? He's going to purge us and take things off of us that are just drawing out you know, precious resources in our life. And that's how the deeds of the body are mortified. We yield to God and God begins to, God begins to take these things away. Not us. You can't. You can't or you would have already. The best way to live the Christian life is yielding to God and letting God do in you what you tried to do 40 times, and you can't do it no matter what. And I, testimony after testimony, even in my own life, I know this, that if God doesn't do it in my life, it, it won't be done. And so I yield my life, my body, everything that is mine, I yield it over to God and say, God, you take away what does not honor and please you, God, you build up what does. God, my life is yours, Father. You do with me what you will. I want to be like Jesus who says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Thy will, O God, not mine. And that applies to purging things in your life. Maybe, maybe I'm just use something generic and 
harmless, okay? In other words, I'm not going to be naming some really bad thing that you do. Let's say that you struggle with watching too much TV, okay? And you like your shows. You like your entertainments, your amusements. Well, let me tell you, you're normal, all right? You are a very normal person. And television is designed to capture us and draw us in. So much so now that we live in a day now, good grief. I mean, I grew up in the 70s where I had to get up and walk across the living room and turn the TV channel from four to five <laughs> and then fine tune it and then move the antenna. My good, now we live in a time where if you missed episode 12 of season four, then you can sit down with a bowl of popcorn and watch all of season three and all of season four of whatever show. They call it binge watching now. You can watch the whole thing if you, you can watch 24, that TV show 24. You can watch the whole season, 24, all 24 episodes in 24 hours if you want. Binge watching. And people do that. TV is meant to draw us in and capture us. So let's say you're having a difficulty turning the TV off. Tell God. Let God have it. So God, I'm, I'm sick of watching the stupid TV. There's things that I could be studying from your word. There's things I could be doing around the house. There's people that need help that I could go help. There's any number of things that you could be doing other than sitting down and watching TV. And you could say, God, take this out of me where it's, it's not pleasurable to me anymore. It's not drawing me in. I don't want to do it anymore. But God, I can't. I don't, have any, I don't have any control over the desires of my flesh and my eyes. So God, please take this away. Now maybe, maybe God will do it right then. Maybe he will. But normally, it's a seasonal thing. Wait for the season. Not, not the next season of the Ben show that you're watching. But wait for... God's timing and then all of a sudden God draws you out of it and then all of a sudden you're not watching TV anymore and you look back and you're going well I'll be I'm not watching TV all day anymore think about that who did that God that's why he th that's why we spending eternity praising him would not ever be done praising him for what he did in our life. Anyway, let me get back to this. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Okay? That's what I was just talking about. Being led by the Spirit of God, let God mortify the deeds of your body through the Spirit. Let God do things in you that you cannot do. You're a son of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Again, Abba, it's not a rock group from Europe. It is, in Swahili, the term is Baba. That's Father. Uh, in Italian, it's Papa. Okay, it's Dad, Papa, Pop, any number. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an informal address to the man who is your daddy, your dad, your dada, your baba, your abba, all right? Don't give me this, oh, you got to say Yahuwah, Shah. Don't give me that stuff. It's abba. That's the spirit that's in us. It's the simplicity that's in Christ. You have received the spirit of adoption. You know that you are his now. The spirit itself, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to inject something here. I can see in my adopted son, um, there is always a struggle in someone that's adopted of identity. Because you, you have in the, your mind that you originally were the offspring of two different people that you probably don't know who they are. And yet, you have this family that's raising you, these parents that are raising you and love you very much. 
and you call them mom and dad and you mean it and they call you son and you know they mean it but you still have that struggle of the old identity and that's normal too in us it's normal all right there's still a struggle in me sometimes of my old identity and that maybe I'm not really a son of God maybe I'm not okay let God have that one too God to help you with that struggle too God listen God knows all about this he knows us all right anyway Verse 16, the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs. Equal heirs. All right? Um, what he has, he shares with us. Oh, I love it. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now again, we have, we have this title, this spirit of God in us saying that we are the sons of God, but we have not been manifested yet. It's like the bud on the rose bush. It's, we see the bud there but the flower has not been manifested. Okay, we're still the bud. All right, one of these days, whoosh, all right, maybe it'll make that sound. Whoosh, okay, we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Vanity, that means you can't yet walk through a wall. You can't fly through the air. You're going to stumble, you're gonna fall, you're gonna drop your keys, you're gonna hit your thumb with a door or a hammer or whatever. We are subject to the vanity of this world. We still have to eat two to three times a day, sometimes four or five or six, okay? We are subject to the vanity. We're subject to the cravings and the lusts of this body, and we hate it, amen? That's why we groan for that new body. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope God forces us to live under the dominion of vanity so that we would hope for a better place. I believe that that's why we're seeing the destruction of our beloved country right in front of our eyes. Why? I love America. I love America. But at some point, God's going to work it in me. I'm going to see what's going on in this country and I'm gonna say God I'm ready for the next one the new Jerusalem he's made us sub he's subjected us in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now and not only they but ourselves also waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Here, God, take this old body. Trade it in for the new one. I'll do it. It's better than Craftsman Tools. Craftsman Tools has a lifetime guarantee on it. And if you ever break a Craftsman tool, you simply find a Craftsman truck guy and hand him your old broken monkey wrench and say, this thing broke on me, it's a Craftsman tool. He reaches in, gets you a brand new wrench. We're going to get the new body. Trade in the old. Amen. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? If we have our best life now, we won't hope for the better life next. I think I said that right. I don't want the best life now. I want the best life later, then, coming. Hmm. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So back to Galatians 3. With that in mind, this, or Galatians 4, let's read what Paul said. When the fullness of time was come, and it'll be the fullness of time again, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem that were under the law, them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Okay? 
We are a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We are the sons of God, and we have the inheritance, but we don't have it yet. Not yet. It's not time. But soon, it will be. And we'll get it in due season. All right? Ponder that today. Let that be your meditation, the meditation of your heart. Thinking about what if you were going to adopt somebody and they had some, some, some sort of defect in them and you could sacrifice your own child for the benefit of a child that's not yours. Would you do it? And it's okay if you say, I'm not sure that I could do that. Because that's what makes God unique and better than us. He did what probably we would be incapable of doing. And he did it for us. That we might receive what Jesus received. I've enjoyed this study. I really have. It's been good to be with you today. God bless you. We love you. We'll try to finish this up next time. We'll see you. Bye-bye.